I wanted to check and see if Westac had an intake for a Pontiac. So I walked over to where the intakes are. I found one. How long do you think <laughs> it's been since this thing ran? Look what's under there. and welcome to the channel. Make sure, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, get that over with. As you can see, I'm at West Tech Performance and today it's all about quadrajets. You know, boy, that kind of quadrajet. Not just a quadrajet, but a quadrajet on a Pontiac. The question is, how much power do we get tuning the Q-Jet? Okay guys, a quick note before we get going, in addition to tuning the quadrajet and giving you those results, there are a couple of other tests I wanted to include in this video. One is a test of an Edelbrock Performer aluminum intake compared to the factory cast iron Quadrajet manifold. And I also want to show you what happened when we changed the oil level on our 400. So what do you say? Let's check out the test motor and then listen to the sweet, sweet sound of poncho power. Now, this is a very interesting test because results happened that I actually I didn't expect. Despite the fact that talking to everybody in the Pontiac community told me, hey, look, that, that factory cast iron four barrel quadrajet intake manifold that they use like on the Pontiac 400 is very, very good. In fact, it's, it's difficult to beat. And you might need to step all the way up to like a performer RPM or air gap if they offer that in order to see that and you also might have to do it on a modified version and as it as it turned out they're probably very accurate here so we compared the uh factory quadrajet cast iron intake manifold with the quadrajet on this 400 the 400 was kind of stock it was as far as we know a flat top piston some sort of stock cam it had the uh six two heads on it so um, small chamber big valve heads it had the cast iron intake manifold and quadrajet. It had an HEI that we recurved. And by recurved, I mean we limited some of the total curve of the HEI because that's one of the problems with the HEI is that they can give you 50 or 60 degrees sometimes of total advance, which you don't need. So limiting the centrifugal advance is a really good way to upgrade the HEI, which we did. We ran long tube headers and collector extensions. And as you can see from this photo, the header gets in this application gets very, very close to the oil filter. And this will be interesting because this will come up later in our test on uh, oil pressure because it was one of my concerns. But we're going to take a look at the oil pressure when you change the oil level. We're going to see what happens to the oil pressure curve, which is very cool. But we ran this combination with the factory water pump and drive pulleys, the crank pulley and the water pump pulley. No other accessories on there. We removed the alternator, which was there, but we removed it and just put a short belt on it. We didn't run the Mazir electric water pump that we normally run when we run stuff at West Tech. And we dialed in the air fuel and timing and jetting. And you're going to see what happens when we change the jetting in the next video. We'll talk about tuning the Quadrajet and how much power it was actually worth. But what I wanted to show you first off is that this is what happened when we went from the factory cast iron Quadrajet intake and, and, and installed the aluminum aftermarket Edelbrock Performer intake manifold. So run with the stock cast iron intake, we made 342.5 horsepower and 412 foot-pounds of torque. And here's what happened when we put the 
factory L or the Edelbrock intake manifold on, it actually did, like people were telling me, it actually made less power than the stock one. It produced 331 horsepower peak. Yeah, 330, let's see. 331 horsepower and peak torque checked in at 396 foot pounds, kind of down everywhere. Now we did install the Quadrajet on this Aww. thing. And the night, the thing, a couple of things I like about the Edelbrock intake manifold. Obviously, I would want more power, so I probably would just pick the stock one. But a couple of things I like about the Edelbrock one, it's aluminum and it doesn't weigh a ton because lifting these things up. That <laughs> no cylinder head and no intake manifold should ever be made of cast iron anymore. They should all be aluminum. Also, I like the fact that the Edelbrock would allow us to run either the Quadrajet or the 4150 uh, style carburetor, which we also had, which we tested in part one. We tested the Quadrajet against the quick fuel 4150, and they basically made identical power, despite the fact that we had to run an adapter to put the 4150 on the Quadrajet intake manifold. And so you, you guys can take a look at, at what happened in that test in part one. But here's what happened when we ran the Edelbrock. So now let's take a look and see what happened when we tuned our Quadrajet. Okay, guys, after we put the Edelbrock intake manifold on there and also with the uh, factory Quadrajet manifold, also we had to do a little bit of tuning on the Quadrajet, which is not unusual. I mean, it was very, very close because this is the intake manifold and combination that the Quadrajet was designed for. So it did very well. But when we had it on the Edelbrock, it was very, very lean. As you can see here, it was as lean as 15.2 or 15.3 at 3,400 and then finally richened itself a lot up a little bit, but only down to 13.5. So it's nowhere near what it should be. So what we did was, what I did was change the metering rods, the secondary metering rods. And in this case, I didn't have full kits to look at to, to try to optimize this. What I was looking for is we had <laughs> the red solo cup full of metering rods. And when I dumped those out, all I was looking for was two things. One, I needed two of them. I needed a set that matched and I also needed a set that were richer than what I had. So I had DB rods in there originally and I found a set of two AX rods. Again, probably not ideal for what we're doing, but here's what happened when I put the pair of AX rods in there that I had and you can see, boom, all kinds of extra fuel. It worked out perfect. Dropped it from 15.5 down to 12.5 and then ended up about 11.5. And the interesting thing is that this kind, this combination actually wanted to run about there. It ran best at that air fuel ratio, leaning that up to 13.0. I know guys always want 13.0 on their combinations, but that didn't work well on this motor. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Let's take a look at the power change now associated with that uh, air fuel change because a lot of times when I do air fuel changes, I'm going to go ahead and move myself down here. A lot of times when I see air fuel changes based on jetting and stuff, a lot of times we'll be playing with it and we'll go, oh yeah, we're, it's it's 11.8 and we need it to be at 13.0 or 13.2 or whatever the number that guys want. And we do that and it just says, look, I don't, I don't really care about this. This is, <laughs> I need this much fuel and this is where I'm making power. But here's what happened. Uh, here's what happened in terms of power. So you can see the, this is the only change here was a metering rod change. I went from the DBs to the AXs in the secondary and that's it. And you can see we had a dramatic change in power. We made, we had a difference of almost 30 foot pounds. It went from 368 foot pounds up to 396 foot pounds. Peak power went from 318 to 330, so 12 horsepower at the peak there. But you can see in certain areas, it was quite a bit more there. And it just goes to show you that, you know, tuning these things obviously can result in a lot of power. One of the other things that we did to this, or the number of other things that we did to this to prep this carburetor for this combination to get ready to go in the car. And once it's done and ready to go in, it should work fairly well. Because what we did, obviously, adjusted the metering rod so that we could get enough um, fuel at wide open throttle, which that worked out to. We also adjusted the air doors because the air doors had too much spring tension in them. What was happening is we'd go to wide open throttle, Aww. we'd load it at whatever RPM we're loading it at. And then at some time during the run, all of a sudden it would, <laughs> the secondary air doors would finally overcome, you know, the airflow would overcome the spring rate and they would open up and all of a sudden, whoa, we'd have Pontiac VTEC kick in and it was kind of awesome, but not ideal. So after taking some spring rate out of that, they opened up a lot, a lot easier and then the transition was much better. We also adjusted the idle screws to get the idle mixture right. We moved the, um, lever on the accelerator pump, which helped transition stuff. Um, and then uh, I think that that's it. We didn't ever have to take the lid off to, to get in and, and adjust jetting or anything because this carburetor was already kind of designed for this combination. So it was already fairly close. And with those minor changes, this carburetor is kind of ready to rock and roll out on the street. 
Our final test on the 400 inch Pontiac was oil pressure and you saw on the gauge, I'm going to show you a little clip here, you saw that even when we were spinning the oil pressure with, or the spinning the oil pump with the drill or cranking the motor over, that we saw some fluctuations in the oil pressure. And while that, that is, um, we're just spinning it over, obviously, and it's not running, the same thing kind of happened while this thing was running. And short of taking the pan off and ch checking the pump and doing all that, which we didn't want to do because the motor was running good, the only thing we could do externally really is add or subtract oil. So that's exactly what we did. We do this a lot on big blocks where if it has too much oil in it, you'll see funky stuff happen at the top of the oil oil curve and if you start taking away oil on the dyno we can do that because the thing's not sloshing around if we start taking away oil we get rid of some of the windage so i thought maybe the same thing was happening with the pontiac but as it turned out <laughs> that's not what was happening the interesting thing also is although I, when i show you this test we had a fairly big change in oil pressure it had almost no effect on power but i want to show you what happens when you change the uh, oil level in your car and how it can affect the oil pressure so this was with about six and a half to seven quarts of oil. Um, it, this thing wanted to run more, more oil. We started off with like five or five and a half and then just started adding it, like I said, because we were kind of chasing. You could see here, even at uh, after 4,700, we see a big drop in oil pressure. I mean, it looks like it's a big drop. It's about 10 pounds. We still had over 87 pounds you know, from the start and it dropped down to 77, which at 5,000 RPM is more than enough oil pressure still. I just don't like to see that kind of drop. So what we tried to do was go up and down with oil. And here's what happened though, when we took out like a quart and a half. Now we didn't, don't just jump in and take out a quart and a half of oil. We take out, you know, maybe a half a quart and then another half and then another half. And we'll keep trying and see what effect it has so that we want to make sure that, and if we see a dramatic drop in oil pressure or have the oil pressure fall off, obviously we'll pull off the dyno. But you can see taking out a quart and a half of oil you can see what this thing, you can see what effect it had. I mean, it dropped the oil pressure like almost immediately on the load in, still about 80 pounds of oil pressure, same as it was before. But all during the run, it did nothing but drop. Now, when I say drop, it dropped it down to out at 5,500 RPM. We still had 55 pounds of oil pressure, which, you know, the, at the rule of 10 horsepower per, you know, the, the RPM thing, that's still probably okay. It's just that I don't like to see a falling oil pressure curve. Now, we don't know exactly what was causing this. Could be a couple of things. Could be that the pickup is too far away from the pan. Could be not enough oil, like uh, not enough oil drain back. So what happens is during the run, all the oil goes to the top of the motor and then we can get starvation. It could be windage, you know, creating a mess that happens in there and then we get a bunch of aerated oil. You know, there are a few things that can cause this, uh, you know, maybe a sticky bypass, you know, there are a couple of things, but it's important to test these things while we're on the dyno and solve the problems there before you go out on the road. Okay guys, what's the takeaway on all the testing on our 400 inch Pontiac motor? First of all, quadrajets, yeah, they work awesome. And they obviously make very good power. As we saw in part one, it's much better than a two barrel because it's a four barrel. It also made as much power as the 750 quick fuel carburetor. And in this test, it did very well even on our cast iron quadrajet manifold, which by the way, made more power than the aluminum Edelbrock combination. Also, tuning, very important on the Quadrant. As we saw, having the air fuel mixer right on the Quadrant made pretty good power gains. And make sure, keep that oil level up on your Pontiac. I'm Richard Holder. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. I'll keep testing.